Hello again, everyone. All right, so we're gonna pick things up now, and it's time to talk about learning a new programming language. The language we're gonna be learning in MSI 245 is Ruby. Um, but we're not gonna spend much time in class uh, learning Ruby. You are actually going to be spending time yourself learning it. Um, and basically, one of the things to keep in mind is you're gonna you're going to learn it uh, a bit over time, but now at the start of the course when you actually have a fair amount of time is really when you should dig in deeply and actually be reading and trying to, to learn as much of it as you can because it's the foundation for all the work that you're going to do in 245 and 342. So you really have to know this new language. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead. And so after you've had an introduction to programming course and an algorithms and data structures course, the basic notion is, is that we always believe now you know how to program. And that means you know how to go and learn a new programming language. Um, I mean, you've actually already learned a new one in R. R for when you're working in uh, your probability statistics course. That's a new programming language and you've already learned it. So you've learned two already. Uh, so you'll be able to learn Ruby. It's well within your means. It's not a, a, an extremely difficult language in any way, shape, or form. And in fact, there's lots of things about it you're probably going to like compared to Java. Um, and actually going back to Java might feel a little unpleasant, actually, in some respects, uh, after getting to, to work in Ruby, which is a, a very modern uh, language. And uh, anyways, why Ruby? I think you're wondering. Why are we not going to be in the land of uh, JavaScript uh, using, you know, React and Node.js and things like that? Uh, why not Python? That's actually a better question. Uh, I think Python is, uh, is fabulous. I think we certainly could have used it in this course. Uh, we we would have used Python with the web platform uh, Django. The course textbook that we have, uh, the engineering software as a service textbook, uh, which comes it's by Armando Fox and David Patterson uh, out of the University of Berkeley. Uh, oh, sorry, it's not University of Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. Um, fabulous uh, school, excellent authors. It's a very good textbook. Uh, the basis of all of that is Ruby and Ruby on Rails. And as well, I think one of the biggest things here is that Ruby and Rails is very mature. Um, they were sort of first on the scene of the new uh, web platforms. And Rails itself sort of established the pattern by which all these other a lot of these other platforms have basically copied themselves. Uh, because it's mature, it's got great uh, automated, automated testing tools. Uh, so we, it really gives us a platform that's, that's real. I mean, industrial scale. It's got excellent tools. Uh, we got a complete tool chain that we can use when we're going from Kodeo to deployment on Heroku. Um, I really like that. It really makes things uh, nice that we're all able to work in the, on the same technology and have it all available. Um, and it's, it is, by the way, while it's no longer uh, a, a hot language and a hot platform, it's still widely used and it's uh, the basis of some very serious companies, our own uh, Canadian Shopify. It's a, a Ruby on Rails uh, company. GitHub, we're going to be using it. You're going to see that's a Ruby on Rails. Uh, Twitter started out as Ruby on Rails, uh, but they've rewritten it in another language now, and so forth and so on. And in fact, I would, I would probably say, um, while many of the mega gigantic companies are not using Ruby on Rails, you are still going to find it on a huge number of smaller websites. It's a really nice framework for getting things up and running fairly quickly. Um, and again, what we learn there, here, is very transferable to everything that you're ever going to want to do with an information system in a multi-tier architecture on the web. 
Um, so it's, there's fundamental principles and even the nature of everything is largely copied across them. So you're, you're able to learn other platforms very quickly uh, after learning Ruby on Rails. And so if you want to just say, oh yeah, that's the, this is the training language and training platform it's for pedagogical purposes, for educational purposes. Um, anyway, but yeah, I, one thing that I wanted to mention again, most of this is gonna be on you. So those of you who are sitting there right now going, yeah, I'm just gonna wait until it's covered in lecture. Oh, he's not talking about uh, how to make a loop in Ruby. I guess we don't need to know how to make a loop in Ruby. No. You should be right now opening up head first uh, Ruby. You should have read the first chapter by now probably. Uh, you should be well into the other chapters. You should be just trying to absorb, you should be practicing in the sandbox in Codio uh, Ruby, writing up, trying out, you know, seeing what the language is like and so forth and so on. You need to aggressively approach learning the material. Otherwise, you're gonna fall behind. Um, it's not, we're, we're, you're heading into a new realm with your courses where not every single thing is delivered to you on the whiteboard or in your, your lecture notes or slides, okay? More responsibility is on you to go forth and use the materials, the web, books, and so forth, and proactively learn what you're going to need to do to be successful. All right, with that, let's talk about the real idea, though. Since, the, you know, besides R, you may not have learned uh, many other programming languages. Now, for myself, uh, you, and by the way, you ask anyone my age, oh, tell me about, we may not even have to ask. People love to recount all the languages that they learned. So when I was in elementary school, I first uh, was introduced and learned some basic. Uh, but for example, so I knew basic in through elementary through high school. Um, and, but I never learned, for example, uh, subroutines or functions or whatever we want to call them. Uh, I actually didn't know what an array was either. So my understanding was fairly limited. Uh, then I went to university. I was a physics major, and I, we were as physics majors, we all learned Fortran. So I took a course, Introduction to Programming, in Fortran. You know, then I really got to know arrays, I really got to know subroutines, uh, functions, and uh, all right, that was pretty. Fortran, Fortran's been around for a long time. Um, I learned Fortran 77, meaning it had been the version I learned had been created in 1977, but it. Um, by the way, history, Waterloo, Fortran, uh, one of the most famous uh, initial compilers was Watt4, developed at the University of Waterloo. Nevertheless, anyway, so I decided after enough physics that I actually wanted, and I became very interested in artificial intelligence, that I wanted to um, do computer science. I also had a, I was a lab assistant in a physics professor's uh, lab, and in that role, I, I, I self-taught myself the uh, C programming language. So learning these new programming languages on my own. So now I've got basic Fortran C. Oh, and then when I switched over to computer science, they made me learn Pascal. So I taught myself Pascal. Um, I guess they were teaching it, but I didn't bother. I just opened up the book and learned, learned it in a couple days because I already knew how to program. Once you already know how to program, you can pick up a new language, computer programming language very quickly. Um, after that, I self-taught myself C++. You know, eventually I had, to, to, had courses where I had to learn Lisp, I had to learn Haskell, I had to learn ML, had, I've learned Perl. Then when I was off in industry, um, somewhere around 19, uh, 95, this whole Java thing came out. So I learned Java and that was, I like, quite liked it with Java when it came out. Uh, then eventually, oh, I actually, Microsoft's got a, something that I think is a lot nicer, C Sharp. I think C Sharp is a lot nicer than Java. 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like you're just gonna keep learning language after language, computer programming language your whole entire life. For me, Ruby has been the most recent one that I've learned. All right, so how do you go about it though? So what's the general algorithm for learning a new programming language? All right, with any new programming language, okay, what you're gonna need to do is always start by learning some key things. You kinda, this is a hit list of um, how to do the basic stuff. And you may have seen, you know, this in the C language, um, and it's now copied by everyone else. Oh, how do you do hello world? Well, you know, it's basically, how do you get a program up and running and print out the string hello world? Um, so what are the key things? These are the key things actually that you learned in 121, in your introduction to programming class. You know, so you go and you look at this language and you go, all right, um, how to write, so I, you know, these are written languages. So how am I gonna write numbers and strings in this language? Um, the nice thing is they tend to be what we expect. We write numbers basically the same way uh, we do uh, when we write them and type them into a spreadsheet, you know? So that's not too hard. Um, Ruby is similar to what you've learned in Java where if you just use an integer, it's an integer. If you use a decimal point, it becomes a floating point number. But Ruby also uh, sort of, I don't want to say magically, but it's really, it will also use uh, fixed point arithmetic or fixed point numbers. Um, it will use very large big nooms so that you don't notice that there's a limitation in the size of like integers and floats and stuff. It's pretty impressive. There's uh, two ways of doing strings. There's just a, a string that's the way it is. And then there's a string that's interpolated that allows you to uh, have variables and express them inside of the string. So you gotta learn, you gotta, there's a, a little bit of difference there, a little bit of difference here. So you, that's one of the things you do is you go, oh, I got a new programming language. How do I do this basic first thing? And you go look that up and you learn it. Um, you know, we always need to, you know, we're gonna need variables. How am I gonna make a variable in this language? Um, in Java, you learned you have to specify the type and there's all special syntax. It's not much here with regard to variables in Ruby. You just start using a string, you know, but uh, how do you name them, you know? So what's the naming syntax required? Are you allowed to use numbers? Are you allowed to use other symbols uh, than, than numbers and letters, you know? What is it? So you gotta look that up, figure that out. Um, you're gonna find, for example, that when you write a class in Ruby that you're going to use a uh, at sign. So in, when you write a class, to have an instance variable, you're going to have, you know, something that's at and then the variable name for an instance variable. So you're going to learn all those sorts of things. That's what you, that's, you're always check, check. All right, I've learned how to do these things. Uh, how to sequence operations. Now, this is one of the easiest one. Usually, again, because most languages is just simply, it's uh, one command after the other. Um, you know, then, uh, how do I do conditionals and branching? And so this basically is you're looking at doing your if and your else. You've got to have a question of Boolean, uh, cause you're going to be computing Boolean stuff. I guess this is kind of goes back to number strings. We really should say and Boolean up here. It's really important. So how do we express true and false in the language? What is considered false? Um, so it's very, so Ruby is actually a little uh, different in that regard. You'll see that, uh, you know, true is true. Um, and I think, 
I just don't remember right now. I'd have to go look it up and I'm not going to say it and mess you up. Um, but yeah, you got to go check, check that out. And that's what I would do. I'd quickly go, oh, it escaped me again. I need to use the concept of true and false. Let me go remind myself what that is. I, I actually, instead of always like trying to worry about what is considered true and what is considered false, what I will often do when programming in these languages is I'll just explicitly always, yeah, I'll find out, oh yeah, okay, it's the, the lowercase string true, the lowercase string false, and I will only use them. I won't rely upon other things being converted to Boolean values because that's something I have to keep in my head then. Um, I'll just be explicit about it. I won't rely upon the implied nature of the language. I'll know that it exists and I'll know that I need to be careful, but I'll just in my programming be very explicit about my usage so that I don't have to overload my little brain. Um, all right. Um, and, and I'm serious about that. After all these languages, it's, you can't keep everything in your head uh, perfectly. So I try to learn a simplified subset that makes me functional in the new language rather than, uh, I mean, maybe if I get a, a full-time job do, doing Ruby, I'll become a, a Rubyist, an expert in it and stuff. But other than that, it's, it's, I got to know what to do to be successful in the language to get going. Um, then you're going to need to, uh, and by the way, so a lot of this is, yeah, what's the syntax? You know, the big thing that you're going to see here is all our languages, they specify the else in a different way. Um, they also, Ruby always uses, uh, the big thing is you're going to see this end statement. So we don't have curly braces that we use in Ruby um, for blocks. We don't have uh, semicolons for the end of the lines and things like that. But boy, boy, oh boy, do you've got an end statement. And you are going to be like so sick and tired of forgetting to put ends in Ruby because it's not used, you're not used to it. Um, but yeah, Ruby de depends on end, 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 and so many places. Um, don't forget your ends. All right. Um, then you need to look up, yeah, how am I going to do uh, repetition in loops? Uh, you know, does it have a for statement, our, our Swiss Army knife of looping? How do I do a while loop? That's the most basic one. Um, so forth and so on. What about some of these other, like a do while? Does it have a do while? Um, you know, look those up, find them out. And then the next big thing, this is sort of the, the key set here. You know, these subroutines or functions or whatever we want to call them, methods, so that we can call stuff. How do we do that? Um, these are the basics. This is what we start you off with in introduction to programming. And so you just always got a new language. You go down this hit list and you look it up and then you can, boy, you know, you add in something like, oh, how do I print a string to this, to the screen? You know, how do I write something out? Grab that. I mean, in Ruby, it's easy. It's just, uh, put S or puts for put string. Easy. Wonderful. Um, then you're able to output stuff. And you're able to like, ooh, I've written a little quick little script. How do I run it? Oh, it's Ruby and the script name. Hit enter. Wow, that's cool. I'm writing in a new programming language. Then you move on. So this is the basics. Then you move on and you go, all right, I learned that stuff pretty quickly. By the way, that's largely uh, chapter one in the head first uh, Ruby book. So you read through that. They'll show you an example of making a simple number guessing game. I think it's a really nice chapter. Um, so you learn that pretty quickly. Then you move on in a language to figuring out the trickier parts. And again, that is the extent that I am going to cover those fundamentals of Ruby in MSI 245. Okay, um, just to tell you, you got to learn them. Uh, the same thing goes for, for these guys. Um, if you have an object-oriented programming language, 
How do you figure out the objects in it? Um, how do we construct them? You know, in Ruby, it's a def class, all right, with an end. And then, ooh, how do I make instance uh, variables in there? I already showed you those ats. Ooh, how do I refer, refer to them in my methods? How do I make methods? How do I make my methods public and private? Okay, before you know it, hey, I'm writing classes. Great. Um, I'm able to make objects. You know, do I need to call new? How do I do a constructor in Ruby for the class, which is called initialization in Ruby? So there's all these little things and you go check, 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 check. I'm going down the list of things I know in my existing language. How do I do it in my new language? So that you can build up sort of initially a translation because you know, oh, I can write it. I know how to write it in Java. How would I do this in Ruby? And you go, oh yeah, I know how to translate it until of course you're fluent in the new language and you just do it in that new language without thinking to, to, to translate things in your head. All right, so what are the upsides objects? What are some of the tricky things? Uh, you need to figure out how to use uh, built-in data structures. And these, the key things in most of these new language, these languages, you, I mean, you have arrays back through the dawn of time, like Fortran, so you always got arrays, but the new languages very nicely um, always have hashes as well. Um, you know, Java, you actually have, you know, you put that, it's a separate data structure, but hashes are like fundamental to Ruby. They're just there. Um, so arrays and hashes. Are, are the, you know, how do I work with these data structures in this language? Because you know that these are bread and butter for uh, data structures. Then uh, you might, you know, you might also like, ooh, what are some other the key libraries or something? These are called gems in Ruby. Uh, that's not, there's gajillions of gems to use. Um, but nevertheless, uh, you're also always wondering, wait a minute, I'm going to write pretty complex stuff. I don't want to write everything in one file. So you look up and you try to figure out how do I uh, use multiple source code files? Each language is a little bit different. You know, how do I uh, include the material correctly so that the compiler or the interpreter is able to run my program when I've spread it out across multiple files. So you go and you look that up and you figure that out. And then of course, by this time, you're like having trouble with some of your code because you're starting to do more complex stuff and you figure out how is it that I'm gonna debug stuff. Now this one I'll tell you is wonderfully wonderfully uh, simple. You just go ahead and at the top of your file, you say require by bug. Okay. And so the require statement will search a library path searching for where the gems are. Uh, by bug should be installed by default. And it will then pull in Bybug, uh, the library, into your program at that point in time. And then, you know, you write a bunch of code. And where you want a breakpoint in your code to appear, you just write the word Bybug. I love it. And so when you run your program, the program runs. And then when it hits where you put this word, it will break into the Bybug debugger. Um, so this is a symbolic debugger, and you can print out uh, the values of variables. You can step through the code line by line. You can view the code. Uh, this is beautiful. I love it. Because, in fact, when we get to Rails, I mean, you can stick, you can stick by bug anywhere in the, in the system. And as you make a web request, it'll eventually hit your by bug, and you'll break into the debugger. So in places that you're like, how in the world am I ever going to, to get into the debugger? It's so easy. Um, it's such a, it's a, it's a really nice uh, setup that, that Ruby has there. Bybug I, is one of my biggest favorite friends. Um, all right. So you figured that stuff out. And again, 
That's the extent that I'm going to be teaching you about that stuff. Then, uh, then you've got the new things in the language. And this is actually hard to identify what these really are often. Now, I mean, you've got to have the textbook for the language uh, that explains it and teaches you, and you have to look to eventually be like, oh, I don't even recognize what this chapter is about, or what's this section of this language? Like, I've never heard anything about this before. That's, those are the new tricky stuff. Um, so, a big one in Ruby are blocks and yields, and basically also uh, lambda expressions, which are the equivalent of anonymous functions. And so it's a function without a name. It's a, and it's already, you're like, what's he talking about? Um, these ten, these actually are critical to uh, functioning in the language. Uh, I'll take some time. Uh, I hope to 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 help you out a little bit with this and showing you some examples. Um, you have also uh, you might come across in Ruby like you would in Python and Perl, but most likely you haven't yet in um, Java, come across regular expressions. But I know from working in Ruby and Rails for a year now that I ended up writing, um, to get my stuff done, almost zero regular expressions. So while they might seem one really important thing, and they could be in some, and they're a super handy tool, um, for string matching, complex uh, patterns, I, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. There's not much that we really need to know about them. All right, so we're probably not going to, to waste our time digging into them. But at some point, you should learn yourself some regular expressions. Uh, we might come back to them. And then you'll see people talk about, for Ruby, this notion of metaprogramming. Now, you will use things in Ruby and Rails that make, that they use metaprogramming to make their magic happen. But you will not do metaprogramming. I sure hope you won't because it's, uh, it's sort of a black magic, I would say. It's a way to really, you gotta be really good and you're probably gonna shoot yourself in the foot. So don't recommend it, okay? Uh, don't, don't waste your time reading, in my opinion, don't waste your time reading about metaprogramming. We might teach you regular expressions just because it's good to know regular expressions. Uh, it's helpful in life to round yourself out as a engineer. Blocks and yield, you gotta know these to function in Ruby. So many things basically use them. So that'll be a really important thing and I'll want to talk about that. Um, we'll come back to that. Um, and so, all right, you divide up the things you need to learn into those three areas. The real basics, the next, the trickier stuff, and the brand new stuff you've probably never seen before. And then, get a book. You know, that's the next last thing. Um, you could try to go forth on the web, but books are really nice because they give a really well-ordered structure to, your, to, your, to teaching yourself. And so I like the Head First Ruby book. I've read it. I, I mean, it's a little... Sometimes the pictures of the 50s and stuff, the art that they have is like, oh, come on. But I like that it's got lots of really nice examples, lots of pictures. It's really engaging in that regard. It gives me something to test myself with, uh, quiz myself as I try to learn the material. Uh, I think the Head First series is set up nicely to, for if you're gonna read something and learn from it, it's actually a, it's a, it's a pretty good way to go. Um, 
There's, of course, the other books on Ruby that I'm that they're there in O'Reilly. There's tons of them. But when you're going to learn something, you're going to... You, I turn to books far more than I ever turn to the web. And that's not just because I'm old. It's because it's the most efficient way because the authors have put all this time and effort into a very uh, careful written uh, order and progression for learning. It's, it's, it's a really nice way to go, in my opinion. All right. What are some of the other really big things we're going to need to know uh, for Ruby? Uh, and I'll do some demos of these after this video. IRB, so this is interactive Ruby. You'll see RB as the extension to the, your file name. So you'll have a file name .rb. So IRB is interactive Ruby. Um, I think I want to point out that this is, uh, you know, this is sort of, you know, like a, this is, this is something to speed up your learning of Ruby. Um, I, because you get to play with the language without having to go through a compile run. You just get to type directly in statements and execute them. It's wonderful. It's also a long term tool, okay, um, for better programming. It's absolutely fabulous to be able to. There's an equivalent version of IRB when we're in Rails called the Rails console. And in that, we can go in there and we can issue uh, calls to stuff in Rails and see it actually execute. Oh, it's so nice, I tell you. Uh, rather than trying to write a little program to figure things out, you can just go put it in and hit enter and see it happen and does it work or not. So in IRB, we can, we can make, quickly make an array. We can call one of our methods that we're writing and see does it actually compute what we want it to compute right then and there. We don't, it, it, it's, it's like the, it's getting to being like what you can have in the real world with physical things. Okay. Um, traditionally, a lot of computing actually lived in this world like what my father had when he was in university where he wrote out a computer program by hand he, he used fortran when he was in school and he wrote out a program by hand then went and used a special typewriter to punch out a punched card um then he or a series of punch cards then he'd hand them to a person called an operator and he'd go and wait and come back the next day and hopefully his program was able to be compiled and run and he got some output. Um, that's not an interactive way to program at all. Now you're in the modern era with fast CPUs and Java kind of seems that way. You know, you you write a little bit and you can hit run or build or whatever. It only takes a second or so. But you're always operating within your program. If you want to just try out something from your program that's not a good way in java but you know what in ruby oh yeah you've got your program in one world you can fire up irb pull in parts of your your program and and run them try them out so you could focus on what's going on with one of your functions again like make an array pass it to the function make a hash do that um, send in some variables to the function and see what it returns. You can use, the thing is, you can use this to help you learn the language. All right, you're like, I'm not quite sure what this does. I see it in the book or I see it in the manual. Well, go into the, the interactive Ruby, type some stuff in, do it and go, oh, that's what happened. You know, for example, you can go into Ruby and you can do you can type in one slash two, so one divided by two. And you can quickly learn, does Ruby do integer math? So it gives me a value of zero for that, or will it really just magically turn this into floating point numbers and return 0 0.5? Interactive Ruby lets you answer those questions by just trying it out. All right, 
Have I sold you on it yet? Because I'm really trying to sell you on the value of IRB. I... And the thing is, it's a new thing. So it's not part of your mindset. Oh yeah, Does is there a, is there a uh, way for me to interactively use my programming language? Uh-uh, you're not used to that. Closest maybe is R, because you are there and you're, ha, you are there. Anyway, you're in R and you can run R code and stuff. It's interactive like that. But now you're, it's, you really, you're in a real programming language and now you can do the same thing. It's, trust me, this is cool stuff. All right. And so I've already said this, you know, you can type a line of code and run it basically, you know, and see what it does. Uh, you can make variables in it and call the functions of your code and stuff. It's great. All right. Um, Next, I was going to talk about Bybug, but I already did that on the previous page. I got ahead of myself. All right. So what I'm going to follow up with is a real quick demo of these things. Um, all right. Dig in. Start to learn Ruby. All right. Great. Bye-bye.